In this lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther at the Diet of Worms. And in our last lecture, we were looking at Luther in the aftermath of the Heidelberg Disputation and the run-up to the Leipzig Disputation, where Luther finally comes out very staunchly and aggressively on the side of the Hussites. Now, for Luther, this isn't a conversion to some Hussite faith or a move to join anything like a Hussite church. Rather, it's more of a slogan. It's more of a programmatic statement that just as Huss had declared that the Pope and a council may err and that all we have is Scripture to rely on, so too now Luther is saying many of the same things. Well, following these several years of engagements and interactions between Luther and the Catholic Church, both formally and informally. Finally, on the 15th of June, 1520, Luther receives a bull threatening excommunication. And the proclamation, or the papal bull, is exorge domine, which takes its words roughly from Psalm 7, 7, which is, Arise, O Lord. It's a call, in other words, for the Lord to rise up in righteous indignation at the heretic in their midst. And what's important about this document is that on 41 points, it is alleged that Luther has deviated from the course of Catholic teaching. Now, this is a bit like any legal process where any minor infraction or major infraction is kind of tallied up as a whole. If you actually look at the document, Exorge Domine, there are really two main points that are being made here. First, there is the belief that Luther's attack on indulgences is unjustified and unwarranted biblically and theologically. Secondly, and more importantly, as we've seen in the past couple of lectures, Exorge Domine points to the fact that Luther has attacked papal power and that he has, in his teachings, restricted the office and the authority of the papacy in the everyday life of the church. Now, all of these points and all of these issues in Exorge Domine, again, did not come out of the blue. Eck, again, is really one of the main thrusts behind this. The Leipzig Disputation and its arguments against Luther's teachings, particularly on the point of him saying that he's a Hussite, are nearly all summarized here in Exorge Domine. In fact, one of the things that's often overlooked is the fact that the University of Leipzig itself actually got its beginning due to the Hussite affair back a century before. The formation of the theology faculty at Leipzig occurred because when Jan Hus rose up and when the university in Prague began to come under the sway of Jan Hus, the conservatives who reacted against this moved to the city of Leipzig and founded a new faculty. So it's no wonder then that when Luther has claimed out loud that he is a Hussite there in Leipzig, with the memory not that distant of the Hussite movement, that Eck, as the senior theologian there, will sort of take this as the principal cause and concern for taking down Luther. So June 1520 is really the breaking point for Luther in terms of his belief, which he did hold with some sincerity for a number of years after the 95 Theses, that there would be a council or any type of reconciliation between what he was saying and between the magisterium and Rome. From 1520 on, what you get in Luther both in his writings and in his public proclamations, is this almost exasperated tone of disbelief that no one in the church hierarchy was willing to listen to him. In fact, it's from 1520 on, with the excommunication bull that comes out, Exorge Domine, that Luther finally begins to refer to the Pope as the Antichrist. Now, people have sometimes looked at this as just a shrewd bit of rhetoric, a bit of hyperbole to kind of sting the papacy somewhat ironically to call the head of the church at the time, the Antichrist. But historians of Luther have always pointed out that Luther does actually seem to believe this. He is somewhat apoplectic. He's somewhat overwhelmingly shocked at the fact that the Catholic Church and the Pope would be unwilling to listen to him on the issue of biblical faith and fidelity on the subject of justification. And so when he turns to call the Pope the Antichrist after 1520, after Luther has been excommunicated. You can kind of sense a little bit of a frustration in his voice, but really a seriousness with which he believes that the church has come under the full sway of the Antichrist. He actually believes this, in other words. From the point of this excommunication bull, though, it is important to realize that what this does is it propels Luther to write him down more and more about what he believes. 
In fact, it's actually quite telling that in 1520, Luther hadn't really written down all that much about what he believed. He had said some things, he had challenged a few points, but certainly nothing had come out in the press in full publication that espoused or taught the full breadth of what Luther had to say about life and faith and justification in the church. Well, with the Exurge Domine proclamation, Luther turns to more and more increasingly radical expressions of what his theological positions are. Now, it needs to be stressed here, he's not radicalizing his position. Rather, increasingly, he's more willing to say exactly what his position is. And so in November of that year, Luther writes one of his most famous tracts called The Freedom of the Christian, in which he lays out all kinds of concepts of the freedom of the law, his idea of the theology of the cross, and of justification by faith. Just a matter of weeks after that, on December 10th, a very famous moment, Luther, at the gate of Wittenberg, takes the bull, exorge domine, that he had received, and he brings it out, and he starts a bonfire, and he casts the bull into the fire in a sort of righteous show of indignation that he would be threatened with excommunication. Now, it's important to understand what he's doing here. He's not actually burning the bull that has excommunicated him. That's something that's usually misunderstood. Exorge Domine does not actually excommunicate Luther. Rather, it gives him a period of time to respond to the challenges or then be excommunicated. And so in December, Luther basically says, I'm not going to respond at all. Not only am I not going to respond, I'm going to burn the questions that you've asked me to respond to. And so Luther burns the bull. And the story goes that Luther's students brought out a number of other texts synonymous with Catholic authority, like canon law and these kinds of things, and they chuck those into the fire as well. Well, finally, it all comes to a head. And so on the 3rd of January, 1521, Luther is now officially excommunicated due to the fact that he has failed to reply to the original bull, Exorge Domine. And so the Pope issues another bull, the official one, Decit Romanum Pontificum. And this is the official ironclad excommunication of Luther as a heretic. Well, the next question that's always asked is, if Luther was excommunicated, why then did he go on trial? Shouldn't a man who had been excommunicated just simply be thrown into prison and executed there on the spot? Well, it all comes down to how the medieval world intended its executions for heresy. This is still the age of Christendom. This is still the age when heresy is a capital crime. But you have to understand that it is not the church that does the executing, that the church only does excommunication and the declaration of someone as a heretic. It does the doctrinal point of the condemning. And in the medieval world, and in this day and age, whenever you are condemned as a heretic, the case is then remanded over to the civil government. And it is the civil government that will do yet another trial to determine if the person is to be executed. Now, this is not just a play on words that the church never executed anyone. There are, of course, plenty of times where we can point out the flaws of the church and places where they instigated and arranged the execution of certain individuals throughout the centuries. But the ideal is always that the church remains free of the capital punishment and that all it does is condemn for heresy. Well, here in January of 1521, Luther has now been condemned. He has been excommunicated. And so the case is then remanded over to the Holy Roman Emperor. And what happens is, is Luther is ordered to appear before Charles V, the emperor at the time. Now, Luther obviously understands what this means. He knows that this means his death. He knows this means that he cannot simply avoid the process. He is a German man. He is part of the Holy Roman Empire. And therefore, if the emperor summons him, it is his responsibility to show up. And this is exactly what happens. The government writes in particular to Frederick, Frederick the Wise, and orders that Luther be handed over and be sent to the upcoming imperial diet. Now, what is a diet? That's usually the first question that a student comes to this with. Well, if you'll remember back when we were talking about the makeup of the Holy Roman Empire, we were commenting on how the emperor is not the sole ruler of these lands. He is an elected official. He certainly has the most significant power in all of the Holy Roman Empire. 
But the government is run by the 300 princes of the regional territories of Germany. And like any elected monarchy or government throughout history, there are times when the lower rank princes or rulers come together for a congress of sorts with the emperor. And this is exactly what a diet is. In 1521, there had been called an imperial diet of all the princes and of the emperor himself, Charles V, and all the surrounding court of the Holy Roman Empire to meet in the city of Worms. And so when the summons comes that Luther is to appear, he is asked to appear at this congress. And since Frederick the Wise himself was to be appearing at this congress as well, they simply couldn't avoid the fact that they needed to show up. Now what Frederick manages to secure for Luther is something that in a very real way saves his life. And that is that Frederick manages to convince Charles to provide a safe conduct pass for Luther. Now what this means is that Luther will come, he will appear at a trial to determine if he is in fact guilty of heresy as the church has alleged, and if so, that he would be condemned to death. But the safe conduct pass means essentially that Luther can't be handed over at that very moment to death. And there's a lot of complexity here, but a lot of this again goes back to Jan Hus, because there was some confusion about Jan Hus's safe conduct pass, which he himself had secured when he came to the Council of Constance just about a century before. The safe conduct had not been arranged or assigned properly. It was sort of still up in the air. And Jan Hus, in good faith, had gone to the council and presented himself. And since the council did not have a safe conduct pass once he was determined to be a heretic and condemned, he was handed over relatively immediately and executed there on the spot. And despite the fact that the church felt that it was in the right for doing this, that they had condemned a heretic, that they had handed him over, that there was not an official safe conduct pass, etc., still the sting of this, the PR battle, you might say, still hung large over the Catholic Church. There was still a cloud of suspicion that they had executed somebody who, in good faith, had come under safe conduct. And so Frederick manages to sort of leverage this point with Charles. He makes a request for a safe conduct, and Charles V gives it. And so on April 18th, Luther, having the safe conduct, sets out and arrives at the city of Worms, where he is to be put on trial. Now, the trial, actually, of Luther, again, occurs during this Congress. It occurs during the sort of standard order of business for the Diet. And when Luther goes before the Diet, he, again, meets his nemesis, Eck. Eck handles sort of the prosecution at this point. And Luther is brought into the imperial room, and there on the dais is Charles V and a number of others. Cajitan is there. A very important cardinal by the name of Gasparo Contarini is there a man who was actually relatively sympathetic to the teachings of Luther himself. But it was Eck who ran prosecution. And so Luther enters in, and he is not, again, put through a process of Q&A as to his views. But this was typical. Luther's views had already been condemned by the church, so there was no need to really put them on trial again. So do not see in this some sort of kangaroo court where they're simply throwing Luther to the wolves without prior deliberation or anything like this. It's not Charles V's job to deliberate on the theology of Luther. And so what Eck does is simply put the question to Luther. Luther arrives, he enters the room, and Eck points to a series of books which Luther has written or tracks that he has written that are sitting on a table there, right there in the middle of the room. And Eck asks if Luther has written these documents. And Luther looks them over, and he confirms that these are his works. And Eck, there on the spot, demands a full recantation for everything Luther has said in them. Now, undoubtedly, many of you have heard the story that Luther responds negatively. He says, absolutely not. My conscience weighs on me. I must affirm what they have to say. Here I stand, etc. But that actually doesn't occur at this moment. Because when Eck first puts the question to Luther, Luther's immediate response is a request for one night to think about it. <laughs> And again, I think this says something about Luther's mind. He knows his death is in order if he says that these are indeed his views and he refuses to recant. And so asking for a night to think about it is not so much a waffling as to his position, but rather a real sort of decision that he has to ask, is he willing to die for what he has said in these books? And what Luther tells us is that the night was really a night plagued by doubts. 
I think we can be sympathetic to Luther on this. He actually says he spends the night in prayer. And the question he asks himself repeatedly is, am I alone wise? Meaning, am I the only one who sees this? If the definition of a heretic is somebody who has his own views and his own opinions on things, and here the world, the power, is standing in front of him, of both the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire, and here he stands as the lone voice, the lone figure, he asks himself in a moment of honest reflection, am I the only one who sees this? Am I alone wise? And then he tells us that he opens his Bible and he reads through some of the key passages that led to his breakthrough. And he realizes that the teachings he is affirming are those that he is finding in Scripture. And just as we've said, the Scriptures are the authoritative view for Luther. Anyone who challenges them or tries to reinterpret them, he believes, is by definition wrong. And so the next day, Luther is again brought into the Imperial Rome. Again, Eck asks him, are these your books? Again, Luther says, they are my books. And Eck again asks that he recant everything that he has said in them and that he rescind his views for the sake of saving his life. And Luther's response is, again, one of the more famous speeches of this period of time. Luther says, unless he is convinced by scripture or reason, that he cannot and he will not go against conscience. And, at least according to the story that was recounted later, he adds, here I stand, I can do no other. Now, there have been some historians who have doubted whether or not Luther actually said the phrase, here I stand. This is the same problem as we had with the posting of the 95 Theses. Several of the eyewitness accounts and the stories of this moment at the Diet of Worms doesn't actually have Luther say the phrase, here I stand. But then again, some of the eyewitness accounts were not intending to sort of be a court reporter recounting everything that was said. And so some historians have sort of sniffed and scoffed at this. And they've raised some doubts as to whether or not Luther actually said the phrase, here I stand, which stings some Protestants and evangelicals a good bit because they're so used to the phrase, here I stand, I can do no other. But I think it's worth saying that it's probably the case that he said the phrase, here I stand, I can do no other. Again, this is not an age in which court reporters are writing down every single word. But what does Luther mean by that? Here I stand, I can do no other. Well, in a manner of speaking, it's sort of a middle voice between open defiance, sort of shaking your fist at the powers that be, and cowering and sort of offering your life if they want to take it. It's somewhere in between those extremes. Typical for Luther at this day and age, he actually is saying something a bit of both. He's saying, you have to convince me that this is wrong. Show me in my text that I'm wrong. He also made a point prior to this that he can't rescind everything he said in this text, that a full recantation would have him recount everything, including the idea that Christ is Lord. So Luther is somewhat hemming and hawing, saying, give me the specifics. What do you really want me to recant of? And Eck simply wouldn't budge, and he wanted Luther to recant everything. But the phrase here I stand is more of a focus on, I know I'm right because I've read it in Scripture. And I know you're going to kill me for this, but all I can do is stand here and tell you that my conscience has told me that this is what Scripture says, and even though it pains me to do this, here I am, this is all I can do. Now, Luther tells us in his own recounting of this story that the guards in and around the room began to chant, to the flames, to the flames, that they wanted his immediate execution. However, Charles V, again, with the cloud of uncertainty related to the execution of Jan Hus, actually was a bit of a shrewd man. He was actually very careful and very patient. It's one of the reasons why Charles V has actually gone down as one of the most well-respected Holy Roman emperors of history. But Charles calls a halt, and he deliberates for a good period of time, and then on May 25th, 1521, the verdict has come down, that Luther is a heretic, as the church has declared. And he is now an outlaw. That is to say that there is a price on his head and that after the safe conduct has expired, Luther is to be arrested and sent to the authorities for a relatively immediate execution. Well, the question most people then ask is, well, why wasn't he killed? Well, there's two reasons for this. On the one hand, Charles does not want to, again, break the pact of the safe conduct. So he does allow Luther to leave. The other reason why Luther was not killed or executed in a quick manner of time is what happens after Luther leaves the Diet of Worms. Luther, having heard the verdict, decides to take off. And he leaves the city, and on the way out of the city, when he reaches a wooded area, suddenly there comes running up 
on horseback a number of Frederick the Wise's men. Now, it's uncertain if Luther knew this was happening when it did happen. You can only imagine, though, that if he did not know that what was about to happen, that he probably very nearly soiled himself as a result, seeing men ride up to him, he now declared an outlaw. But Frederick's men ride up, and they kidnap Luther. Because for whatever reason, Frederick had decided that Luther had not been given a fair shake, that he did not like what had happened. And probably, Frederick liked the attention that Luther gave him in his university. So Frederick ordered that several of his men would take Luther and would put him in hiding, kidnap him, and that in the end, they wouldn't tell Frederick where he had gone. And for years, until Luther comes back out of hiding, notes and summons are sent to Frederick from the Holy Roman Empire, demanding that Frederick determine where Luther has gone and let everyone know where he is hiding. And Frederick very sort of shrewdly would say, I have the foggiest idea where he is. (laughs) And he meant it because he didn't know where Luther had gone off to, because he'd ordered his men not to tell him. Well, where they take Luther is a famous place. It's a castle called the Wartburg Castle. And for a number of years, Luther hides out here in the Wartburg. And he does a number of things that are sort of very um, indicative of this period of time. While there, Luther goes by a different name. He no longer goes by the name Luther. The name he goes by is Junker George. Junker is something like a low rank German knight. And so Luther hides out. And Luther does two things here. One, now that he is excommunicated and now that he realizes that he has broken with the Catholic Church, he spends as much time as he can solidifying and galvanizing the movement that he has started, which would eventually be known as Protestantism. The other thing he does is he begins once and for all to tear down the medieval structures of monasticism that he had known since he was a boy of 18. One of the things that people often notice about this time, for example, is that Luther grows a beard. In fact, the one picture we have of Junker George Luther is this picture where we see this beard on his face. Now, whiskers are one thing, but if you realize that what he's doing is is he's reacting against the monastic order. He grows his hair out. He becomes something of a hippie. He doesn't keep the clean face and the tonsure that he had taken at the age of 18. The other thing Luther does is he turns his mind to the translation of the Bible from Latin and Greek and Hebrew into German. And this move in particular is extraordinarily important because it is based on his commitment to put the scriptures in the hands of the laity in a vernacular language that they could read and understand in an effort to break down the medieval understanding of the Catholic Church. And so now Luther, the heretic and the outlaw, is becoming, once and for all here in 1521, the reformer, the man who had found the Lutheran Protestant Church. Okay, that's it. Next, we're going to be looking at Luther at the Wartburg and his translation of the Bible, as well as some of his other proclamations that he makes to German sympathizers for his Protestant Reformation. (laughs) 